Rich, let's take a look at the first couple chapters here. Um, all right. Now, when I first heard about malware analysis, I thought it would be impossible because I thought you would have to take a virus, print it all, all the assembly code, which would be hundreds of pages of assembly code, and then figure that out with like a pencil drawing lines and arrows all over it. And you could do that, but it would probably take a month to analyze one virus. And you don't have to because there are tools to make it faster. Now, sometimes you really have to go back to reading the assembly code and figuring out, but that is the slowest and most difficult technique and the easier techniques often work. And the thing to understand is you have simple goals. So consider this, a student, one of my students was a consultant and he called me and said they had a medical clinic, they found malware on a workstation, so they hired him to just reinstall Windows on that machine and said, there, we're done. And he called me and said, uh, are, am I done? And I said, no, you are absolutely not done. Um, the fact that you found malware on a workstation at a medical clinic, you need to examine and see what else happened. Bad guys could be in control of other servers. It could have spread to other places. I mean, if, that, if your client tells you to stop, you have to stop. But I would make a record in writing that you disapprove of this and recommend more because that is not a proper incident response process. There's quite a lot more to it. When you find a breach of your security policy, you have to check and see how much harm has been done? How far have they spread? Have I really got it all? So you need to, here's the, and it's always the same questions. Are, is there malware, other malware on the system? Is the attacker still in control? What did they steal or add while they were there? And how did they get in so we can keep them out? This is the same questions you always have. So this is all you want to know. You don't want to know everything about a piece of malware. You just want to know enough to make it efficient to answer these questions. And typically, the main thing malware analysts want to find is indicators of compromise. You want to find something the malware does that is easy to detect, like it creates a file, it makes a network connection, it creates a registry key. Then you can quickly write a script to scan all your machines to see if they have that file or registry key and find out how far the infection went. That, then the other thing you'd like to know is what harm it did so you can um, roll back those systems. And so for, this is not commonly understood, although as time passes, more people get it. For example, LinkedIn got hacked. Uh, years ago, maybe about 10 years ago, and their immediate first response was to lie. LinkedIn got hacked, a bunch of uh, hackers found, took their password hashes and cracked the password hashes, but they took 60,000 hashes they couldn't crack and posted them on a Russian forum, which is how we all find out. We're in the security community, so we'll use passwords on a Russian forum, so I looked on there, and my account was on there, with, and I cracked the hashes, and it was my password. And I said, hey, LinkedIn got hacked, that's my password, and many other security professionals said the same thing, and LinkedIn said, no, we didn't get hacked. They tried to just lie for another week. Then they finally, then they finally when they, a bunch of us screamed bloody murder and said, dude, you've been hacked, that's my password, then they said, well, okay, uh, we did get hacked, but we checked with our lawyers, and we found out we don't have to do anything about it. And I'm like, you can't, just gotta ignore it. You're not gonna do nothing, you can't do that. I mean, they said, well, there's nothing private on our servers anyway. It's just resumes and stuff. And I said, well, the passwords are kind of private. And by the way, you can't just continue to use your servers while bad guys are in control doing God knows what on the servers and just do nothing about it. And indeed, you can't. And they eventually had to spend millions of dollars in response because you can't just completely ignore a security incident like that. Anyway, so malware, we're trying to figure out how it works, how to identify it, and how to defeat or eliminate it. It's part of instant response. So, you're trying to find out what happened, how to locate all the infected machines, how to contain the damage, and find signatures for your intrusion detection system so you can tell, so you might make host-based signatures, which as I mentioned are things like files or registry keys, but you can tell by scanning one machine whether it's been infected, and all machines with IP addresses are called hosts because of a historical thing, even though they aren't hosting anything. Like I said, the easiest way to understand computer technology is everything means the opposite of what it says, because uh, the problem is there's been many generations of evolution in computer technology. Anyway, um, so you look at what the malware did, and then there's network signatures, network traffic that identifies the malware, and this is often extremely useful. For example, one very common te technique is you infect machines, they have a permanent a bot agent on them, and they make phone periodic network connections back home to the command and control server. So you can find at your firewall all the people that are going to that IP address, and they're all infected. So it's very handy. 
when you can find network signatures. Now the problem is um, there are false positives in all detection techniques. Uh, this was a problem at the college. Uh, we hired a crooked chief technology officer here who came in and made a fake virus incident claiming that we had thousands of viruses on all our machines and they'd been there undetected for 10 years because he had a consultant friend that he brought with him. He went from high school to college to college doing this. He would go in and then have a fake virus incident and his consultant would come in and always find them because he had some he would take your network traffic, send it to him. He claimed, I have all these secret malware signatures from the FBI that are not publicly available, and I can detect all these viruses other people can't detect. And so he got, gave the report, and after battling this guy for half of a year, we finally got our hands on the report. And the report showed, for example, that there were 200 Windows viruses on our DNS servers which run Unix. So that's impossible, and that gives me a clue what he's doing. What I think he was doing was he got a list of malicious IP addresses and he took any machine sending traffic to those IP addresses and took that as an indicator of infection. But it isn't. Your DNS, if you have email that comes in, every time you receive email, your DNS server is used to make a reverse DNS lookup to see where that email should have come from and compare it to where the email did come from as an anti-spam measure. So when bad guys send you email, your DNS server does send requests back to the malicious servers. It doesn't mean you're infected, it's just a normal process, and I think that's what he was doing to get these ridiculous uh, virus infections that weren't really there. So we hope to do better than that. So here's the main techniques you use for malware analysis. There are four ways to do it in two categories, static analysis and dynamic analysis. Static analysis examines the malware without running it. And so we're going to, things like virus total, which will just um, see if somebody else has already done the analysis for you. Strings or bin text will just read, find all the readable strings in it. So you can just read the messages, which will often tell you what to do. Or you can use a disassembler like Ida Pro or Ghidra, which will give you the assembly code. All of these extract them, uh, examine malware without running it. But more easy and fun is dynamic analysis. You, which again, I thought was insane when I first heard of it, you run a virtual machine and deliberately infect it with the malware. And you run tools on the compromised operating system and use their output to analyze it, which is extremely sloppy and I couldn't believe anybody would do that. I mean, in principle, the malware could shut down or confuse your tools, but in practice, most of it doesn't. So you have to understand it's the same thing with cops. There are these complicated techniques like DNA analysis, and there are these real simple techniques like just looking at security cameras, and you just try the easy stuff first. Even though you know it won't always work, nothing's always gonna work. So you try the easy stuff, but just remember that nothing is guaranteed to work and the criminals are intelligent and they often make things just to confuse your tools and just to confuse you, the examiner. So if you get weird, confusing results you can't figure out, don't waste your time, go to a different tool. Try another way, because there are traps. Um, one thing that happened to me years ago when I used to teach Windows tech support, uh, one of my students came in and said, listen, I'm a network technician at my company, and I, the guy that told me this is not an idiot. He told me his Windows XP machine got infected with a virus and it turned it into Windows 98. And I said, you know, I remember a time when I would have said, this guy's just an idiot, but I'm not so sure. I looked and that virus does exist. What this thing did, it would infect your machine, and now it would disable all the things you're going to do to clean it. So it had a list of all the free antiviruses you would download, and it would block those sites. And if you tried to run Windows Update, it would play a movie of the Windows 98 Windows Update going by to make you think you were putting on updates when you weren't. So, I mean, there are traps in the malware to trick you and confuse you. That's the thing to be aware of. So anyway, we run tools that monitor a machine, primarily Process Monitor, Process Explorer, and Wireshark. I don't use RedShot that much, but you can. And you also analyze the RAM, which is very handy, on the machine that has been infected. And you see what the infection did to that machine. This is one good way to get evidence. There is some risk involved. It is good to have your machine isolated from the network. A separate hardware machine would be safest, but a virtual machine is usually safe enough, and that's what we're going to use. Although, there is some malware that escapes virtual machines and attacks the host. That is possible, but it's not very common. And then they have the basic and dynamic. Basic static analysis views malware without looking at the instructions. You don't have to read the assembly code, so you use things like virus total and strings. Uh, this only works for the simplest cases, but it's fast and easy. Uh, basic dynamic analysis is also easy, um, where you just run it and see what files are connected, collected, and so on. Then there's advanced static analysis, where you reverse engineer it to make the readable assembly code, and you read it and figure it out, which is more difficult, but very powerful. And advanced dynamics is um, 
easier, but still fair, more difficult than the easy one, where you run the code in a debugger so you can stop the code and examine the state of the registers and such as it goes. And we're going to do quite a bit of that. Debugging is a lot of fun, and you'll learn a lot about Windows code. All right. So as you probably know, there's lots of malware. Backdoors give the attacker control of the system. And botnets are the most common type where you have many infected machines controlled from one control panel, the command and control server. There's malware that is just used to download the next stage of malware. It often comes in stages because typically when you have an exploit, you can only execute a small amount of code. So you execute a small amount to download something bigger for the next stage and something bigger for the next stage. That's the sort of way it usually goes. Um, sniffers, key loggers, and hash grabbers steal information from the machines. And there's malware that just launches other programs. And there's rootkits, malware that hides itself very carefully in the very heart of the operating system, so it is very difficult to detect and remove, far more than most uh, malware. By the way, once I, I think not on this list, but a more important technique these days is living off the land. Since so many people have gotten good at analyzing malware, an increasing number of attackers have learned to not use malware. They just use legitimate system administration tools, like ones from Sys internal, and do whatever you want to do by using existing tools to avoid setting off alarms. However, here we're mostly into the malware. And then, of course, scareware that tricks people into doing things. Uh, this one, you've probably seen these things pop up and say, you've been viewing porn on this computer or something. Uh, one of these guys saw them, and then he turned himself into the FBI, um, being frightened by the scareware. But anyway. Uh, and uh, spam senders, worms, ransomware is the big one. Everyone's afraid of these days. You get infected and you have to pay the ransom to get your stuff back. Um, a lot of news about that. Mass malware is the most common type where many, many machines are sent identical files. That's the sort of thing where you'll be able to see it on virus total because somebody else will have examined exactly the same file and you'll have the information. Uh, that's the cheapest, lowest skill attacker. If you're targeted, a specific target by a, by a high profile attacker because you're, for example, a critical infrastructure and you're attacked by the enemy military, then you'll have tailored specific attacks. And that's much more difficult to attack, much more difficult to prevent. And this, of course, is things like Stuxnet. Stuxnet was a military operation formed by the United States and Israel in partnership, and I think also with Germany. Um, planning to take down the nuclear isotope separators with malware that would cross a air gap and destroy their isotope separators, and it worked, and it was very interesting to analyze. I mean, I was actually, when Suxnet was first exposed, I was on an airplane going to a security conference, and they explained how it worked, and on the flight, I got part of it working. I showed up and I say, I've abandoned my talk. Whatever I was going to say is not interesting. This is interesting. It had four zero days in it. It was very good. The part I thought was amazing was you could have, you plug in a USB stick and a folder would pop up showing you the files and you're already infected. You don't have to open them or anything. The routine that drew that little picture of folders and files was what activated it by, by dill hijacking. It put in a malicious dill that ran automatically and that was very interesting. I got that working and showed it to him. That was, anyway, Stuxnet uh, raised the bar. So here's, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. It would do anything it wanted. It got control of the machine. And typically at that time, people were logged in as administrators, so it had full administrative control of the machine immediately. Oh. It was back in the days of Windows XP. Wow. Um, that's why it was, it was very easy to hack Windows XP. It's harder now. Vista was a big step forward for Windows. Yeah. Oh, you said it's back in the days of Windows XP, so nowadays that thing doesn't work. Uh, that particular attack, of course, got patched and wouldn't work, but there are other attacks. And um, the basically, uh, there are attacks that will punch through anything. For example, um, it just came out two weeks ago that the last four generations of iPhone hardware have an intentional backdoor in it so that somebody, presumably the NSA, can just take over your iPhone and read everything at any time and you'll have no clue this is happening and there's no way you can patch it. And it's been that way for four generations of hardware before anybody noticed it. So there are military weapons that can do that. They can take over whatever you've got. You won't see anything. You don't have to open a link. You don't have to answer a message. They just sail right in and read your stuff. Those things exist, and they will always exist, I think. No defense will ever stop them. Um, the only thing is they aren't in common use by low-level criminals. But the nation states have them, the military have them, and probably the larger criminal gangs have them. This is a, a thing to be aware of in case you think that you're using a computer and you're safe because you use Linux or something. I would not make that assumption. 
it is far safer to imagine that um, you have to do threat modeling. There are some threats you can stop, like normal criminals that just want to steal your credit card, and there are things you can't stop, like, you know, if the government or the police or the NSA wanted to get me, they could get me. I don't have no possible defense. I mean, the only person I know successfully hid from those, well, two people did. Bin Laden did by living underground in a cave for like 10 years, and Snowden did by fleeing and living in Russia under their protection. So unless you want to do one of those two things, you're not escaping the U.S. government, so <laughs> there's no point fooling yourself. It's just if you aren't doing anything too horrible, then they're not very exciting. They could look at my stuff, but why would they? I'm just an ordinary guy. Yeah. Is that why Snowden will put the cell phones in a microwave and he didn't Oh, well, if, yeah, yeah. If you put your cell phones in a microwave, then I think that isolates them like a Faraday cage. So while they're in there, they can't get any signals from the outside. That's right. And that's why uh, Nick, um, Nicole Perlroth, the New York Times cybersecurity reporter who recently moved, retired from that position, she gave a talk. She talked about how when she met contacts, and she reported on national security, so high-value contacts, she said you had to go there with no cell phone, no computer, no nothing. She would drive far away and meet them like in a coffee shop and have just a pen and paper. No electronics of any kind. That's what Bin Laden did too, no electronics of any kind. That's what you got to do. Yeah. So they can track you even when the device is off, they still know where you are? Uh, yes, if your cell phone is, is off, but it could still receive a call, then it's still connecting. Now, if you take out the battery, then it's really disconnected. Or if you wrap it in tin foil or put it in some kind of metal box. But um, that's why you know, the people that are not messing around, they, uh, because if, you, if there was like a GPS tracker in it, then it would still reveal your location before you put it in the box or something. So you, you just leave it all at home if you're not messing around. <laughs> and then, of course, you might wonder about your car, because your car now has all kinds of computers and GPSs and radio and network connections in it. Um, just, I would probably want to take like an Uber or something, but then they could get, you know, you, if you start going down the paranoid hole, life gets really hard. You know, basically, the best thing I recommend is just don't be very important. And then the government won't be after you. But if you're really somebody that the government's after, you've got a serious security problem. That's why you have to do threat modeling. Decide what the real risk to you is, and then take measures to protect yourself against that. And most of us, I hope, are not being hunted by military and law enforcement, because then you'd have to do extreme things to hide from them. <laughs> anyway, um, so here's some rules. Don't get caught in details. You don't need to figure everything out about the malware. You just want to find a few simple facts. If one tool fails, just go to another. Don't get stuck on a hard issue. And remember, malware authors are your opponents, and they're constantly raising the bar. So don't be surprised when you get confusing results and tools fail. That's why you have to have an arsenal of a lot of tools. All right, well, let's try a Kahoot. Um, Kahoots are these quizzes just to keep people awake. Oh, I see some questions here. Uh, let me see. Uh, sure, you do an ad request for any of my classes. I'll let you in. Um, have Pegasus. Yes, Pegasus is absolutely out there. It's a real thing. It's a tool that will just take over your iPhone and, and take all the data off it. This is what the Prince of Saudi Arabia used to hack Jeff Bezos. It cost, it's expensive and hard to get at, although I got a friend that claims to have three versions of it, so apparently it leaks. Um, but uh, Pegasus is real, and you can... Uh, so, I mean, that's why I, mean, I have students come to me and say, people are hacking my phone, they know everything I'm doing, and I say, well, that's not impossible, you know? It, it just means, however, most of us, not, nobody's willing to spend that kind of money to attack us, but if you manage to really annoy somebody really rich or really important, they could totally do that. Yeah? Yes, yeah, through pictures and also through instant messages. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, and there's constant versions. So, I mean, the, the tools are available if you want to pay for them. But uh, most of us aren't important enough to justify such an expense, I imagine. Anyway, let's take a look at a Kahoot. I got to log in. Okay, that's the one. All right, this is just a uh, optional quiz. It's worth extra credit. If you have some kind of computing device like a phone or something, go to kahoot.it and put in that number. And uh, the three highest scores get three points. Helps keep people awake.
or what? That's right. Yeah, each, that's right. Each point is got is worth up to a thousand points. You rate it on speed and accuracy. Right. Which technique requires deliberately infecting a computer? <laughs> Dynamic analysis, you have to run this stuff. And of course, you have to run it in a special machine you don't use for anything else because you're deliberately infecting it with a machine. By the way, anything you do with malware, you should be doing in an isolated virtual machine. You often end up running it by accident. And tools that you don't think will run it will run it. I've made that mistake several times. I tried to analyze PHP malware, and I tried to stop it before the malicious part, and I was wrong. It already got to the malicious part before that. So you always have to be in a safe, isolated environment whenever you're working with malware. All right, what technique can find many infected computers from a single point of measurement? See all the machines that are sending network traffic to the suspicious place. All right, which one involves running parts of the code and stopping at breakpoints? a lot of fun and used to cheat on games among other things. We'll do quite a bit of it in this class. All right. All right. What kind of malware spreads to other systems? conceals other code.
That's a rootkit. Rootkits fool your operating system into ignoring certain files, certain processes, certain network connections, so it's doing something you don't know about. All right, if you use a fake name, you'll have to tell me your real name if you want to get your points. And Joe may not be a unique enough identifier, although it might be a real name. So Michael will get his points. The rest will have to give me some information at some point of their real name, or they won't get points. Uh, anyway, three points every time you're in the top three. All right, uh, let's try doing another section here, I think. All right, so basic static analysis. Um, typically, you, you scan it with an antivirus tool, or you calculate a hash value like an MD5 or a SHA-1, and uh, compare that to a list of known antiviruses, or you look at strings, functions, and headers. Um, so antivirus scanning is, of course, the easiest one. Virus Total, now a Google product, is the most convenient. Um, you can upload a file to Virus Total, and it will scan it. But then, if it's malicious, it will send it to all the antivirus companies, which will then add it to their signatures. And anybody else can look and see that you scanned it. Now, if you are under attack by an, a targeted attack, you might have a virus that is not used anywhere else, and uploading it to virus total might violate your operational security by alerting the attackers that you have found them. So it is considered poor operational security to do that. What is better is to calculate a hash value and search on virus total for the hash value. That'll tell you if it's commonly used malware and somebody else found it without exposing your, uh, the fact that you know it to the attacker. So hashing, just gives you a fingerprint. There's MD5, SHA-1, SHA-2, various kinds of hashes. Uh, for this purpose, they're all about the same. It just combines all the bits in the file to get down to a small fingerprint. And um, that's a unique identifier of a file like a fingerprint. So it looks like this. Microsoft doesn't give you a hashing tool by default, but you can download HashCalc, and then you can have things like MD5 and SHA-1, both of which are considered to be sort of old and not perfectly reliable although really reliable enough in practice for most uses. SHA-256 is probably what we should all be getting used to using instead, but there are many, many tools that still work with the older MD5 or SHA-1 systems because in practice they're probably good enough. All right, so you can label a file, share it with other analysts, and search for it online to see if somebody has identified the file. And strings extremely powerful and fun and easy. All it does is read through a file. A file is just a series of bytes, and only some of those bytes are printable characters, the ones from about uh, 31 to 127. All the rest are not printable, so you get a series of printable characters of a certain length, like four or five or longer, and then that makes a readable string. That's all this does. It finds all readable strings and prints them out. Some of them are just random junk, but it will include all the messages, all the help messages, and other things, all the names of libraries, all the names of functions, and so on. So often it'll have lots of useful information. One dirty trick, though, is Windows software typically does not use ASCII. It typically uses a very old attempt to make an international system, the very old form of Unicode. Um, now, the modern way to do this is UTF-8, and UTF-8 can use one, two, three, or four bytes to encode a character, and therefore it has millions of possible characters, and it can handle all the uh, financially important languages in the world, Arabic and Chinese and Japanese and um, those little emoticons like hamburgers and stuff. All that stuff is in, in UTF-8. But Microsoft's Unicode is a very old version, which simply went from one byte to two byte per character, which is really not enough. It's only 65,000 characters, and that's not really enough, but it was a step up. And so what it means is when you're storing normal English, you waste half the space. You have to have a null byte after every byte because it's just the English characters encode with the, the English the ASCII code for B is 42 in hexadecimal, and the Microsoft Unicode is now 4200 has a null byte after each character. So you have to know this is the Unicode representation of the string. All right, so strings command will find all strings. It's, you can get it for Linux or Windows. And so if you're on strings on a file, you'll see them down here. And so here's something that looks like an IP address. Here's uh, the name of a Windows function and a library, another Windows function. Here's some kind of system message. So you know, that's the sort of stuff you get. Uh, things which are quite informative after you learn how to recognize them. Microsoft function calls have this layout of words rammed together with the words capitalized to separate them. And these are Microsoft libraries, DIL files. So after you learn what Microsoft object names look like, you can just spot them. 
and they give you a clue what the malware is doing. We're going to use this tool, Bintext, a McAfee tool that is just a graphical version of doing the same thing. So it finds all the strings. This is Notepad, Microsoft's simple text editor. Every Microsoft program starts with this message. This program cannot be run in DOS mode. Then it has the text, data, and resource sections. These are the sections of the files called PE sections. We're going to talk about those a lot. Here's the libraries it uses, advanced API, kernel, graphical device interface, user interface, all very common ones. Those are the libraries used by it, and so on. So you can learn a whole lot about a file this way without having to read anything other than really English. So now another thing you can do is your malware can be packed and obfuscated. Uh, often people like to compress things just to make them smaller, and then you can put an unzipper in front of it, so then you'll, but you can take original executable, you can make a packed one, and then have a wrapper program that unwraps it. This makes it smaller, and it means the strings will no longer be readable because they're zipped, so they'll be modified in some sort of binary representation. In practice, what it does is break them up into shorter strings and separate them. Um, so there's a tool called PEID to identify what sort of file this is. PE stands for Portable Executable, and all Windows executable files are Portable Executables. That's what they're called. There are three types. There's EXE, the most common, DIL, the next most common for libraries, and COM files, a really old technique. And all of them are Portable Executable files, and this tool will detect what type of Portable Executable file it's in. It will try to determine what language it's written in. And if it's packed with a known packer, it will tell you the packer. So this is telling you this file is packed with UPX, the Universal Packer for Executables, which is one of the free open source packers that will pack executables. So UPX, you're running the command line. So if I make a file here where I just print this program contains readable strings and compile it, um, then I'm, this is um, showing the file, and then I pack it with UPX. And so it packs, it was half a gig, half a meg, and it packed it down to a quarter of a meg. And it will still run. This is a Linux file, but you can do it with Windows files too, and that's what we're going to do in this class. So um, it obfuscates the strings too. If I run the strings on the unpacked file, um, then the packed file, um, right, I, got, I guess I got 300,000, 30,000 strings here and only 20,000 strings here. Sort of hard to read that thing anymore. All right, anyway, um, and this is something I wanted to mention before. A PEID, like many other tools, looks like it's just doing static analysis, but sometimes it will run the malware. That's why you always have to be working in an isolated environment. Some of these tools run the malware without telling you, which is rude. So be aware of that. Um, all right, so the portable execution file format, something you're going to learn in this class in great detail. PE files are all Windows executables, and it's a data structure that contains the information Windows needs to load the file. So you got a PE header, which tells it the type of application, the library functions, and the amount of size to allocate in memory to fit in the components. And so Lord PE will show you this information. You can dump information about a running file. This is, again, Notepad. And you'll see here what it looks like. It has four sections, text, data, resource, and relocation. And here you see how big they are and their relative size and so on. And um, it has an entry point here and a location of the base and so on. We'll talk about all these things as we go ahead. You'll get familiar with these terms. Um, so there are a lot more sections in principle, but the main ones that you always see are text and data. You always need text and data. And by the way, remember the uh, Microsoft rule, everything is the opposite of what it says it is. The text file is unreadable assembly language instructions. And the data is where the text goes, um, just to keep you guessing. All right, so uh, let's take a look at another Kahoot. Then we'll take a break. We're right on time here. do it after the coops, I guess.
All right. So how do you mathematically calculate a number to uniquely identify a five? What techniques finds the readable text in a file? file type has headers specifying sections like text, data, and resource. property, but the best answer is PE. That is the name of the type of file with these sections in it. These are all PE files. Even the packed one, the packer has to be a PE file or it wouldn't be able to unpack. But they are all in the category PE, portable executable. All right, what file is shared by many different programs? economical but unsanitary practice of Windows operating system and the number one way malware is executed is by tricking it into loading a malicious library. We'll do a bit of that. All right. I know who that is. Right. Joe's one twice. Are there two different Joe's? Oh, right, that's a problem. <laughs> Another two different Joe's? Oh, you won last time. Okay, a different Joe. Fair enough. Well then, good. Uh, I can get more information from you about which one you want. All right, good. All right. Well, anyway, it's uh, five minutes to seven. Let's take a ten-minute break. We'll pick up at 7.05 and do the last bit of this chapter. I'm going to lock my machine to maintain a proper security posture. But I'll be back. I'm going to step out. I'll be back in ten minutes. And I think we're going to open these windows a bit more. It's getting kind of hot.
Oh, yes. Good point, Joe Apple. You can use PowerShell for that. All right. Let me get rid of this for now. We're not going to do that. Let me get my VMware up.
Microsoft. It's very, very annoying. That's why all I do is get rid of it as fast as possible. Well, it's five after. Let me start another recording. Oh. <laughs>